Amin Tamsh Puyuhan, thank you so much for joining us for AWP 2023 and our panel called Native Survivance, Defiance and Culture Keeping Through Memoir. I'm so excited to be here with all of these incredible authors. Um, and I just wanna give again a thank you to AWP for organizing this and thank you to Heyday Books, specifically Kaylee, um, for helping us get all of this started. And then especially thank you so much to the authors that are joining <laughs> us here. And I'll give my brief introduction and then I will give um, an introduction description for each author. And then um, after that, we're gonna do a brief um, uh, kind of sneak peek of some of our authors writing in their published memoirs. And then finally for our roadmap, then we'll be um, answering some questions, um, asking some questions to our authors to answer about their authorship, about um, their upcoming projects. And um, yeah, just what it's like, you know, being a California indigenous author right now in the publishing industry. So if I can briefly introduce myself, Hamin Tamsh Puyuhan, Nitawan Karen Duro, Nut Maratyam Ami Kumayai Ami Haiku, um, Nut Vara Varaniat, <laughs> um, Nanan Atawan Fastino, Niyachuiv Atawan Lanet, um, Nun Ananiach, Nun Tuvipiav Kika, Ama Ayat. Hello everyone, my name is Carol Ann Duro. I am Serrano um, and a Kumeyaay descendant. And um, I currently reside and film recording from my reservation. I am also a linguist and I am also the bookstore owner of Quiet Quill Books. I have my little <laughs> mug of coffee this morning. Um, and I also run um, a bookstagram called Indian Book Nerd, where I love sharing all of our authors here, pictures of their books and some of my reviews of reading them. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. And so if I can get into introducing our authors. So first, Greg Saris, who's with us today, if you want to give a little wave, Greg, <laughs> um, is Coastal Miwok and Southern Pomo. And he is an award-winning author and tribal chairman of the Federated Indians of Greats and Rancheria. He received his PhD in modern thought and literature from Stanford University and has taught as a professor of creative writing and American Indian literatures. He is a playwright and author of several works of fiction and nonfiction, including Grand Avenue, a short story collection that was adapted to an HBO miniseries. And his most recent work that we're really excited to talk about today is um, a memoir and essays called Becoming Story, A Journey Among Seasons, Trees, Plants, and Ancestors. And Greg, I just want to give you the opportunity if there's anything else you wanted to share for your introduction. Um, no, except good morning, and thank you, Carol Ann, for your um, bookstore that's featuring our books. Love it. And yes. Ever good morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg. And next, I'll be introducing Ursula Pike, if you want to give a wave to how me not Ursula, um, is a graduate of MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts, she has an MA in economics with a focus on community economic development and served as a volunteer with the Peace Corps in Bolivia from 1994 to 1996. Her travel memoir that we're excited to share and talk about today is called An Indian Among Los Indígenas and it recounts her experiences as a Peace Corps fellow working and living alongside native Bolivians and her work won the Writers League of Texas Manuscript Contest, uh, Texas Manuscript Contest in the memoir category in 2019. So Ursula, I just want to give you the opportunity to, if there's anything you'd like to say in your introduction. Yeah, I just want to say Ayuki, everyone. Hello. I'm excited to be part of this interesting conversation. Thank you. Hakupa I thank you so much, Ursula. And last but certainly not least, we are so excited to welcome Deborah A. Miranda as well, who is Ohlone, Esalens, and Chumash, and she is a professor of English at Maritime University, where she taught literature of the margins and creative writing. She is the author of four poetry collections and a memoir that we're so excited to talk about today called Bad 
Indians. Oh, sorry. I'm just getting a phone call. So, um, called Bad Indians, a tribal memoir, which was recently reissued in a 10th anniversary edition. And her memoir received the 2015 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Award, a gold medal from the Independent Publishers Association, and was shortlisted for the William Sirowen Literary Award. And so thank you so much, Deborah, for joining us today. And if there's anything else you'd like to include in your introduction, please feel free feel welcome to. Thank you so much, Carol Ann, and Salakiatza to Greg and Ursula. I'm really honored to be here with both of you. This is really a treat for me. Yay, Hakupa, I thank you, Deborah. And so for our roadmap, we're going to actually go around to each author and we're going to do a reading for our event, which is so exciting for each, of, giving the op opportunity to each author to read um, a brief, uh, portion from their memoirs to share with us and then you know maybe have a little bit of discussion about that before we get into our questions. So Deborah, would you like to start us off? Sure. As you noted it's called a tribal memoir not just my memoir. So I'm going to read a piece um, from my grandpa Tom. These were taken this story was taken from some recorded stories that he left for us. It's called Grandfather's. After a good many years, they were married, my grandmother and this man. And the old man went into business, making medicine. They said he was good. Every kind of weed, root, whatever he got, he cooked it some way, put it together. He was known as Dr. Tarango. Oh, I guess he's been dead years and years. Everybody said, something go wrong, let's go see Tarango. I was up there when the pumpkins came in bloom one time. But Faustino Garcia, that was my grandfather. Him and my grandmother, I guess they separated. The old man, he had a nice place way back up there, the other side of the mission, on the other side of the river. I think he spent his whole life there. He had a little place, about 10 acres, and he used to dry salmon when they speared salmon. He got some pieces of wood and he used to dry them, then cut the skin off the fish. Salmon, this big, you know? He put it up in this tray like, and he charged money too. He said it cost him money to buy salt. I remember him well. Old Tarango, he was ornery. He didn't want nobody. I stayed with my grandfather up there two or three different times. I was very small, but I remember he used to treat me nice. This story is like the rolling waves of the Pacific, just the surface of what is really going on. Beneath Tom's wistful words about his grandfather, Faustino, I hear the voice of a small boy whose experience with tenderness, with gentle adults, with a respectful and loving relationship to the land is brief, but potent. He must have feasted his eyes on those rich yellow pumpkin blossoms to remember them so well in his old age. I hear Faustino's quiet efforts to live out his life close to what remained to the mission, where he'd spent his life, going back to the survival skills that had served his ancestors well. I hear a longing in Tom's voice, a longing for the warm welcome of his grandfather, for a place to belong. Hakupa, I thank you so much, Deborah. I sincerely love how your memoir brings alive the faces and um, humanity of the mission system that I think sometimes in our education system feels so distant and faceless and just not alive in the sense mm -hmm. of the real human beings that were there. And when I would read your memoir, I was, it was so emotional, like reading the personal descriptions and hearing from uh, the histories that you've brought to the page. Um, mm -hmm. And it just like, it just like really made it so personal. Um, each of the histories that you uncovered, I distinctly remember in the beginning about a woman in the mission system that you would write a poem from. 
Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I really sincerely appreciate it and appreciate your memoir so much. It taught thank me you. so much more about the mission system. And my dad, Faustino, actually really enjoyed um, <laughs> reading your book as well. Oh, and thank you. What, yeah, what we would talk about is just how real and raw your tone was. Like, mm. it felt like I was having, like, dinner with you and we were talking so, you know, candidly mm. about the about the history that you were uncovering. So thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to give opportunity if anybody else wants to talk about the um, reading from Deborah. Thank you for sharing that that part. That was that was really beautiful and a wonderful way to start out this this conversation. I think. Thanks, Ursula. So I wanted to bring it to Greg if you would like to read um, a, a segment from Becoming Story. Definitely would so welcome that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, the, I'm reading a section from sort of the last essay um, or, or memoir. There, there's a series of um, memories of essays in this book, uh, memoir pieces. And the last one is actually, and they're all about me coming back home. I grew up in Santa Rosa here, uh, born and raised here, and didn't leave until I was 19 years old, but then didn't come back until um, 20 years ago or so. I would always come visit, see my family and so forth. But um, I didn't really come back. And um, I always, I've always written about the place, even as I've lived in Los Angeles and other places. It's, I mean, when you're born and from a place and hear the long stories, it's, you, it's in your blood, it's in your DNA. But anyway, I came back and um, this story is about actually remembering a, a human bear, a woman who was reputed mm -hmm. to be a human bear. We, we have had a lot of those and uh, the human bears here were the most powerful women's female bear cult. But anyway, in this essay, I, as I often do reflect back. And so this is sort of just a short piece about me, the moment coming back and getting back in touch, feeling the place I came from. So I write uh, in the middle of this essay, I bought a house on Sonoma Mountain, <clears throat> bay laurel trees, live oaks and white oaks around the house. And past the trees, there is an expansive view west over vineyard-covered hills and the urban sprawl below to the Pacific Ocean, which is where at night the web of streetlights stops and where, on a very clear night, the full moon lights the sea. <clears throat> that light, that path of moon on the water, was how the dead found their way to the next world, or so our ancestors said. And those same ancestors gathered pepper nuts from the 600-year-old bay tree outside my gate. But I was like that, suspended between the old bay tree and the far horizon, as I negotiated what it meant to be home. I hadn't lived on the mountain before. I grew up in Santa Rosa. Then the place remembered me. Stories beckoned. The dead rose collected with the living, so that more and more the landscape became a meeting hall of raucous voices. I knew the faces not merely my tribal members, as if I was convening a tribal meeting, but the land itself, mountain and plain, oak trees and city lights, birds and animals, Indians and non-Indians, Mexicans, Italians, Blacks, Filipinos, Jews, whomever and whatever I'd known, whomever and whatever I knew was before me, beckoning, yes, the dead and the living. How could anything die this way? History, it's no less tangible, palpable, than that grandmother under whose care you found yourself. In a kitchen table you have known all your life with its familiar smells and colors, this grandmother sets a plate of warm tortillas on the table with a bowl of chicken soup and says, eat. Thank you. Akupa, I thank you so much, Greg. I was so vivid, especially that ending that you ended on, especially tortillas, warm soup. I think we can all relate to that. Um, I especially really uh, adore how your memoir really emphasizes our connection to place as, in, as California Indigenous 
it's in common, but the uniqueness of our home that you describe of each of our hometowns yeah. of the Santa Rosa mountain of, you know, these ancestral territories that we all have names for long before California was even a term. And your memoir, even in the title and in each essay really drives home that the uniqueness of our tribal identity is that connection to place. Um, and I feel like I was just, it just comes alive when, when reading and listening to you talking about, you know, the details of the environment and the plants yeah. and that, and you even bring it to the spiritual connection of how your ancestors talked about their creation story and where they go when they pass on to the spirit world. So thank you so much for reading that with us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I just want to say that there there is one line that you read that's that really struck me when I was reading it, which is how could anything die, which comes after this litany of beautiful plants that are surrounding you and the connection. I, I mean, it just made me think of all the rootedness that was going on around you and how could anything die? It just gets transformed over and over again. And I really love that. Thank you so much for that line. Uh, thank you, Deborah. One of the things that all of us in various ways, and you would certainly in your memoir, is you, you said the word rootedness. Mm. <laughs> and that's kind of what we're um, establishing, reestablishing, reconnecting, rerooting, yeah. um, or seeing how wherever we go, those roots are still attached. Right. Uh, we haven't forgotten. Um, so many of us don't live, get to live in our homeland anymore. Um, but it was nice to know that we don't forget. And by the way, we owe our ancestors as much. They didn't. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg, for your excerpt. And I want to give the uh, opportunity now to Ursula to read from her memoir, um, uh, uh, in Indian among Los Indígenas. So I'll let you take it away, Ursula. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, the beginning of the second chapter. Uh, it's an overview of Bolivia, specifically indigenous Bolivia. Bolivia was isolated, isolated by mountains and expanses of sparsely populated rugged terrain. It was a landlocked country that lost access to the Pacific Ocean in 1904 after a war with Chile. In Bolivia, the Andes Mountains broke into two separate ranges and continued bumping along South America into Chile and Argentina. There were vistas of snow-capped mountains and tranquil llamas silently chewing in the foreground. But Bolivia also had mountains of jagged orange and slate jutting toward the sky. Centuries of wind and rain erosion had revealed layers of red and gray minerals. Roads were built around the treeless steep mountains because there was no going over them. In Potosí, the high altitude bone chilling city whose silver deposits inspired the hot greed of Spaniards, the hard brown shape of Cesar Rico literally rich mountain, could be seen from every narrow street and open plaza. Bolivia was also home to the world's largest salt flat, Salar de Uyuni, an expanse of horizon skimming whiteness that stretched for mile after barren mile. An Aymara Indian story explained that the mountains were surrounding, the mountains surrounding the salt flat were once giants. One of the giants deserted his wife for another woman while his wife was breastfeeding their child. She cried and cried, and the tears mixed with the milk and ran down her chest in white streams, covering the vast area between them. When it was dry, the sun reflected off the salty whiteness. Light-skinned tourists were burned to a shade of pink, not unlike the flamingos that flock there to mate every November. During the rainy season, a thin layer of water accumulated on the surface and turned the salt flat into a giant mirror that reflected the sky and erased the horizon. Tourists were drawn to the remoteness, to the myth of Bolivia's savage purity. It let them prove they were travelers and not tourists. Tourists ordered frozen blue drinks from the hotel bar. 
Travelers, by contrast, rode buses without shocks for 50 cents while suppressing their explosive diarrhea, proving their hardiness. What about the grandmother seated next to the traveler? She'd been riding the same bus for 20 years. The bus was luxurious compared to the back of the truck she'd ridden the previous 20 years. Would she see a difference between a traveler and a tourist, or would she simply see a gringo riding through a country as though it were a roller coaster? The eastern border of Bolivia pressed up against the backside of Brazil. The rivers from that region flowed into the Amazon basin, and the jungles were full of the, large, of the world's largest rodents thick vegetation and piranha. By the 1990s when I was there, the Eastern Lowlands were one of the poorest regions of Bolivia. Giant cattle ranches with few cattle remained. Many hid processing operations that turned the coca leaves grown nearby into cocaine for North American snorting. We were told it was a dangerous, messy part of the country, thick with yellow fever infected mosquitoes. But the tribes in these lowlands had built, had built causeways that stretched for miles, controlling the water and enabling large communities to exist well before the Spanish showed up. The mountains, the salar, and the thick jungles all made Bolivia a difficult place to explore. The isolation and remoteness helped the Quechua, Aymara, Guarani, and other tribes maintain their culture and language for centuries. But the riches in the ground itself works against their efforts. Gold, tin, rubber, mahogany, cocaine, lithium, and even the water drew Westerners who did what they do, explore, infect, desiccate. But those tribes, those natives were still there, speaking their languages, dancing, feeding themselves and their children. Hakupa I, thank you so much, Ursula. I think it was really great that we followed after Greg, who was talking about place and the description so vividly of the environment on the mountain in Santa Rosa. And then for you to provide such a deep description of the Bolivian uh, environmental landscape and how you kind of brought that native perspective when you went to the Peace Corps and ended by thinking about the indigenous Bolivians who live in the area that you were visiting and learning so much from. I, I know I've shared with you how much your book resonated with me over the past couple years um, and just the experiences that you had, you know, coming uh, from that California indigenous perspective, seeing the similarities of indigenous Bolivians, but also so many differences that you were able to learn from. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Ursula, you know, as you know, I read and reviewed your book. I believe I gave it a blurb. I really, I gotta go back and just say, I really enjoyed it. Uh, particularly, I, I'm a person who's had a, not a experience in Bolivia, but in Mexico with a lot of the, in the mountains, the Mexican indigenous people and so forth. And what your book really brought home, and I wish some of my people um, would read it, um, is the extent in, to which indigenosity is so strong and rooted in these places. And, um, and you know, they'll say things, well, I've heard my own, some of my own tribal citizens say, well, they're, they're Mexicans or whatever. Well, a lot of them, the Mexicans here and there don't even speak Spanish. They speak, you know, they only speak their indigenous language and they come here and, um, you know, we're all trying to revive our languages and so forth. And I, I, I see these, uh, the people and the economic conditions, Ursula, that, you know, we're poor, but they, they give poor a new def definition. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's what came so clear. I wanted to give my book to, some of my complaining tribal, your book to some of my complaining <laughs> tribal citizens and say, see how lucky you are. <laughs> Don't complain. Uh, to my Thank, you for say Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for your thoughtful readings and sharing with us your beautiful book covers. I love that all of your editions are in hardback now. So excited about that. Um, so now we can get into the question and answers for the author, some of these that I created with Kaylee. Um, so uh, if I can ask Deborah the first question um, and then proceed 
for everyone else to answer. Um, sure. Why did you all choose memoir to tell your story? And then what unique attributes have the genre have you utilized to deliver the story of the California indigenous experience? I've been thinking about that question and especially the first one. And the, the real honest to God truth is memoir chose me. I thought when I began writing what wasn't even titled Bad Indians, I thought I was going to take my grandfather's tapes and put some historical context around them and use them to flesh out a history of the missions in California and how indigenous people um, were treated and survived and sometimes didn't survive. I thought it was going to be a very scholarly book. And then I went and spent a year in Los Angeles um, researching and traveling all over the state really. And the voices that I found in the archives really just took over um, what I was writing. And I, I, I couldn't really control what was coming out. I, I wrote poems, I wrote short stories, I wrote vignettes. It just became something with a mind of its own. And I, I realized after a while that this was not just my story, not just the story of my ancestors, it was our story. It was a tribal memoir. Um, and so I began to think of it as a book of collaboration, a book in which many voices came together. And sometimes for the first time, some voices had um, something to say, had a, had a, a place to say it in. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a strange memoir <laughs> in a lot of ways um, because it's not just my voice, it's many voices. So yeah, I, I don't think I made a conscious choice to turn it into a memoir. It, it just wanted to be that way. Um, and for the second question, um, you know, what, what parts of memoir? Um, I think that I really was fortunate in that I had had some wonderful encounters um, with other indigenous authors in various ways, sometimes as friendships, sometimes in a uh, creative writing workshop. And um, especially Leslie Silko um, had a real influence on um, my writing and also some non-native writers. Um, I had a great workshop with Dorothy Allison. And some of the things they taught me were that, you know, memoir is, it's different for every person. Um, what there is that you need to unlock, what there is that you, you know, as Dorothy says, you know, what's the story you can't die without telling. And I discovered different different parts of that. Um, you know, I needed to talk about my ancestors, but I also needed to talk about how the, the experience of historical trauma for them resonated for us in my generation. So I think memoir was really useful for that because it allowed me to do a lot of time traveling. And I think that's probably the part of memoir that I love the best is how it allows you to range back and forth in time um, and how to show how, you know, an ancestor in the 1800s could be speaking to me in, you know, 2013 when I was writing the first edition of the book. So that was, that was a real pleasure to discover. Um, and I, I think it's something that a lot of people um, have also used in memoir. Thank you so much, Deborah. I love your response of like answering that call to be a vessel for your ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna remember that. What is the story that you have to tell, you know, before, mm -hmm. you know, we pass on to that spirit world? Mm -hmm. um, Ursula, how would you answer this question on why did you choose memoir and what unique attributes of the genre did you utilize? Well, uh while I was in Bolivia, um, I received a package from my auntie and it was a stack of like seven empty journals. And, um, and I filled them all while, while I was there. I wrote and wrote to kind of deal with and process the experience. And from that, um, I started writing something, at taking those and turning them into uh, a narrative. And for me, I think because the source material was my voice, in my voice, my experience, uh, it, n memoir just seemed like a, a natural choice to 
an easier choice also to take those and, and turn them into a story of my experience. As far as the um, elements of genre, of memoir genre that I use, you know, I really love the, the insight that genre can give into my experience, the, that um, experience of, or my thoughts when I was first there and how those evolved over the time that I was in Bolivia. I love being able to show that growth in, in who I was as a person, as I had these different experiences and learned more about myself and my experience uh, through memoir and insight into into the thoughts in my head because I don't always speak what I'm thinking <laughs> when I'm in a situation, but but being able to talk about the thoughts that I was having in that memoir was really helpful. Thank you, Ursula. I so admire how you were able to keep so many journals during that time. That's something I would love to do for myself with my dad. Um, Greg, if you uh, could share with you, us why you chose memoir to tell your story and what unique attributes did you deliver the California ex uh, indigenous experience to tell that story? All right, uh, thank you, Carolina. First, uh, I wanna, I was just suddenly feeling very um, guilty or in trouble. I was thinking of, I know Dorothy, Alice and Deborah, and uh, um, what's the story that you, you, you know, you can't, uh, you must tell before you die. And immediately I thought of uh, the old people who said, um, the person who dies, our old people always said, the person who dies with the most stories is the richest person. Whoever has the most stories at the end of their life is the richest person, not money or anything, but the stories. And of course, the flip side of that, um, and I'll get, answer the question in a moment, is that I'm always telling myself, I won't live long enough to tell all the stories I know. So, uh, you know, um, Dorothy will, I, I'll listen to you, there's, I'll have to just figure out which ones, but stories I must tell. But here so much, many of these memory pieces um, in the memoir, Becoming Story, were assignments for other things like writing about this place or that place. And I have found over time that I can't, to be perfectly honest, or as I like to tell my students, to write you must be naked. And um, it's um, an honest, and you know, too often we're given these frames of write about this or tell how this is Indian. I hate that because the borders of identity for all of us are porous. They're not rigid like the ethnographers and others would like to know. We are simultaneously Americans. I was a street kid. I was all of these things as I was experiencing. I mean, when I used to go up to the res and they'd be doing all the sacred dances and the other kids and I would be sitting on the top of the car hoods, you know, smoking weed or sniffing glue. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? So how am I a whole person in time? What is my, how do I think when I'm thinking about a tree? I can't think about it separate from the history of myself and my people. Deborah, all those voices. We aren't just one, but we're the voices we hear. And so I, I try to incorporate that and leave for people a sense of a whole experience of a self. So um, my subjectivity, if you will, is the whole of my experience. And I try to provide that and give that and also help us understand and accept all parts of ourself. So often um, today with identity politics and all this, you know, when I was young, I was, the old people used to say, oh, you're too light, march, you know, uh, you know, say you're Spanish or say you're Mexican. And then, you know, AIM came along and you're too light, march in the back. What and who are we doing that? We're replicating those colonizing patterns. The best way to undo them is embrace it all. <laughs> and that's what I've tried to do. Thank you so much, Greg. I feel like you answered perfectly what I wanted to get into my next question about how so often our stories have been written from non-California indigenous people. And I really appreciate that you said not putting us in those 
strict constrictions, but like you said, and bear these vast intersections that we have as people. So if I can uh, uh, ask Ursula this question about, you know, how historically so often the California indigenous perspective has been told by non-native people. So why is it important for us to tell our own stories? And how do you feel about being part of what I have kind of been calling like this renaissance of California indigenous storytelling that has really taken off in the past um, few years? I feel like when I was growing up, I didn't see so many stories written specifically by indigenous people in all kinds of genres, fantasy, horror, um, memoir, all of these amazing things. So how does it feel to be a part of this, um, you know, uh, contemporary moment in native publishing? Yeah, well, um, I, that first part of that question, I, I just think, well, it's it's important for any any population to, to tell their story or anybody to tell their story, regardless of their, um, their background. But it's also more interesting. I also find it much more layered and complex. Uh, I teach creative writing and the stories that my students from a variety of backgrounds write are always so fascinating to me and t and show me things about a culture or a way of life that I have never read before and I love that and I find it I find it really interesting and this is an exciting time to be to be writing and to me what's the most exciting is relates to what Greg was saying that there are no boundaries to what native author, native lit is. I think that one, that was one of the most wonderful things that I learned while I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts. There were all these native poets and authors writing about a variety of things and also, you know, experiencing that challenge of someone asking them, well, that poem isn't really native enough. Can you read something that's a little bit more native? Um, I remember uh, Orlando White telling a specific story about reading a poem about the letter I and the letter E and, and the reaction that it got. He was the Diné poet that was supposed to read a certain thing in a certain way. And I really love those challenges, um, the, the things that we're doing to, to break those expectations. Yes, I love seeing Native people in their niche, special, fantastically unique uh, interests and hobbies and things that they enjoy without having, like you said, to just perform that indigeneity. I feel that so much about your memoir and your enjoyment in travel. Um, thank you so much, Ursula. Greg, how does it feel to be part of this um, expansive, exciting time of more Native authors being published? And why is it important that we tell our own stories? Uh, well, uh, Carol Ann, thank you. I'm, I'm the oldest one here. I've been at it for a while. So I've seen uh, uh, quite a few, uh, a lot of changes. And uh, just to tag, I mean, and I'll, by telling a story, and I'm a storyteller, I'll answer the second part of the question, but I remember being at Stanford in the creative writing program, and I was writing the stories for Grand Avenue, and the professor said, who are these people? You're never going to be able to publish these stories because he couldn't under, they were urban California Indians from a California Indian uh, tribe, and, and you know, if they, unless it was on, uh, an Indian was on a pinto horse chasing buffalo, they had no sense of what was an Indian? I mean, they were having me, the big stories or the minimalist stories in those days where, you know, Sarah goes to Martha's Vineyard one summer, has an epiphany and decides to part her hair on the other side of her head. I didn't know from those people, but whatever. Um, but, you know, you persevere. There has been and continues to be, and thank God for shout out to Heyday Press for California Indian writing, because on the East Coast, and in television, you, you know, even though I did Grand Avenue, everything you see that's out there is planes oriented or connected to the planes. And I want to, I fought that from day one and I will continue to fight that. 
including I'm going to go to my tribe tonight and we're going to institute some money at Sundance Institute for California Indian writers and filmmakers writing about California Indian stories. Um, I am adamant because still I am having a hard time with the big houses. They'll publish, they like, they like victims, love victims where alcoholics or the guys are all men, poor men struggling to find themselves. We know those stories no matter where we're from. But the California Indian experience, which is so rich, there always was and still is, are more Indian people in California than anywhere else west of the Rockies. But we were murdered here. There was a genocide because Washington didn't see what was going on west of the Rockies. It is our duty for our survivors here to fight us writers to tell our stories here in California, those of us who are from west of the Rockies. And so there's wonderful heyday press, and despite the Renaissance, California Indian stories must be a very visible and viable part of that Renaissance. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg, especially that you mentioned the film and TV industry that takes place in our homelands here in Southern California, in Hollywood, that is on Togva land. And very much so we have a right to be a part of that renaissance and that representation. Thank you so much, Greg, I really appreciated that. Deborah. if I can ask you the same question about why is it important for us to tell our own stories and how do you feel about um, this moment that we're in, in terms of native authorship? Sure. The thing that, that strikes me, I mean, we all know that if you're not telling your story, somebody else will tell it. And they won't tell it um, in your favor, for the most part. I mean, they can't, right? Um, but the other thing is how that affects us, how it, it's, it's like a, a ricochet. You know, somebody shoots a story out there and it, it hits something that comes back and hits us. And we begin to ingest and become and believe the stories that we hear about ourselves. And I talk a little bit in Bad Indians about how all I ever heard about California Indians was that we were lazy and drunks and all dead, <laughs> by the way, you know, and, and I grew up not having, you know, much contact at all with my Indian family from the age of three to 13. And you know those those stories. I when I when I did reconcile with my California family and tribe, I I saw how those stories had affected all of us. Um, I mean, one of the smaller stories is that a lot of older relatives have a lot of Indian kitsch in their houses and John Wayne posters and you know Lakota warriors on the bookshelves um, because they were so hungry for some representation of their indigenous identities and there wasn't anything. Um, not in movies, not in books, not in art. Um, it just, they couldn't find it. And so they were, they were ingesting this other kind of Indianness that was very much manufactured by Hollywood and by mythology. So that's a real danger. Um, and I really um, stepped in it when I started writing Bad Indians because I wasn't going to write you know, that kind of, of material. I really wanted to uncover a specifically um, mission traumatized California Indian and the amazing people who survived that and, you know, what they did to survive. So that's every tribe in the United States has its own story and our story really hasn't been told. So that really motivated me. Um, it still motivates me. And yeah, the publishing world for indigenous people has gotten better, but um, it's still very difficult for California Indians to get published, whether you're a poet or a memoirist or you know a fiction writer. Um, we're just not on the radar of publishers. And you know, I know that um, many, many California writers have struggled with this. But right now, um, a really amazing um, Maidu Two-Spirit woman, Janice Gould, passed away a few years ago. Her memoir is just stunning, and yet she can't find a place to, you know, her, her spouse can't find a place to get it published. So, you know, 
it just seems to me really irresponsible of publishers to let amazing stories like that pass. So yeah, I, I myself have a hard time. I always tell my kids, I'm famous in California. You know, <laughs> I'm not famous anywhere else, but you know, I'm famous in California. But I, you know, I can't get a poem accepted by anything except a poetry magazine that's doing an indigenous, a special issue of indigenous poetry. Oh, yeah. That's what I get into every time. Um, and it's very difficult as um, Greg said, I'm not Indian enough for those, in, you know, special, for those non-special issues. And I'm too Indian for the regular issues. It's just, it's a conundrum. And we just have to keep pushing um, and creating our own publication opportunities, you know, coming from within tribal entities and um, universities, I think is the way to go right now. Definitely. Thank you so much, Deborah, for your answer to the question, because I certainly feel like so resonated with me about, you know, how many phone calls and emails we get in October for Indigenous Peoples Day and Native American <laughs> Heritage Month. We've all been there that last minute. Can you come speak for this type of thing? And it's like we're here 365 days a year. And it's certainly outside of just the certain genres or publishers that we've been relegated to, we definitely deserve to have a space. And so I, I'm hoping even for more fiction as well. And, you know, so for us to reach so many genres. Um, and it really resonated me with too what you said about, you know, our elders watching film because they were so hungry for things. And I've shared with my dad every single one of your memoirs that are here, I've shared a copy with him that he's read all of them. And he came back to me and said, I cannot watch those Westerns the same way after reading so many things that you've brought home. And I'm like, exactly. So your stories are making a difference in terms of when our elders turn on those screens, you know? Yes, Deborah. I just, just wanted to tell Greg, my dad passed away about 10 years ago, but before he did, I gave him a copy of the Mabel McKay book and he ate it up. It was his, they were his places. They were his people. He knew some of them. He was, he just loved that book. And I think it really fed his soul. So thank you for that, Greg. Well, thank you. Uh, Mabel fed mine and you pass it on. That's what we're doing. So fed my soul. I need the reference there, but thank you. Thank you so much. So Greg, if I can ask you our next question, what do you hope that readers take away from your book? And what has been, you know, a remarkable uh, form of feedback that you've had since publishing? Um, well, if, if I'm hoping anything, you know, as an as writers, we I always say to myself, you're so arrogant, you assume somebody wants to hear something you have to say. Um, so you, you have to try to humble yourself a little. Um, I hope that they'll get a sense from my book of a deeper, longer understanding of a place as home. A deeper, longer understanding of a place as home. And even though, as was mentioned, it may not be your home, it's a way, it becomes hopefully a blueprint to begin thinking about home with the whole self, no longer the, it's a wonderful way to undo the colonizing tendencies um, of this whole us, them, and what side are you on, but more of creating a we relationship with your world from yourself. Get over those old paradigms of us, them, and go back to what indigenous people, I believe, always had was a we relationship with the world whatever that is, how you find yourself. Um, so I hope that, you know, you will enjoy the stories. I mean, I've all, you know, I have a lot of my wonderful and relatives in there, um, but I hope that, uh, that they will uh, enjoy their stories and get a sense of what it means or a way to think about place and a way to think about home. I think today we're all, we're all, you know, in many ways, all of us are, become um, much like the people who came here. 
we become homeless in our homeland even. They're homeless people who come from afar, but the process of colonization has made us homeless also in a way. We've been, and so what we're doing is try to rehome or restory the landscape so that we can be home and safe once again. That's sort of it. Thank you so much, Greg. That was really powerful thinking about how that act of dispossessing and removal, you know, it, it can happen mentally and physically. Um, thank you so much. And so uh, I'm gonna ask Ursa and Deborah the same question and then hopefully we could get to our last question. I know we have 10 minutes left. So Ursula, what are you hoping that readers take away from your book and what feedback have you gotten? Well, I, for me, one of the most important things about my the story that I told is I wanted to show an example of a modern, educated Native woman making decisions, making mistakes, living in the world, the modern world, and engaging with other Indigenous people. I think about Therese Marie Mayotte's Heartberries and Alicia, Alyssa Washuda's books and other modern Native women writing about their lives. And to me, it's exciting to show this because these are the women that I engage with every day in in my life. And and I love to put that on the page and, and have people see themselves in a way that they've never been portrayed. Um, and some of the most amazing feedback that I've gotten has been from other return volunteers of different backgrounds, especially BIPOC, other BIPOC uh, return volunteers who really didn't are still struggling with their experience of working, uh, representing the United States government, working in a um, in another country with black and brown people. And, and it helped them, they've told me that it's helped them reconsider their experience and um, kind of be willing to explore some of the difficult lingering effects of that. Thank you so much, Ursula. I'll never forget your interaction with uh, another indigenous Bolivian woman that you shared, kind of speaking of that modern women, native to native perspective that really resonated with me in your book. Um, Deborah, if I can ask you the same, what do you hope readers take away from your book? And what is some remarkable feedback that you've gotten? I think what I hoped for from the beginning was that this was a book for California Indians. Um, yes, specifically Indians with, um, you know, ancestors from the California missions, um, which is only part of the state. Um, but I, I really felt like this, that was my main audience. Um, and I really feel like I made that connection and I'm still making that connection. Thanks to, um, you know, it's a small book from a regional press, but it has made its way into, for one thing, the um, university system, um, which means it's getting to young people, um, you know, at a really crucial stage in their lives and young California Indian people at a really crucial stage in their lives. And I think it gives them permission to have a voice um, and it gives them, there's so many doors into, you know, the different, kinds of writing and representation, the images that are in the book, that they see there's a lot of different ways to be California Indian. You know, there is no one way that they have to be. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad. I really feel like that has made a difference for some people. Um, and, you know, boy, the, the stories that I hear back from people have been quite heartwarming. Um, a lot. There's, I included in this in this hardback edition. There's there's quite a few new pieces, but there there's an essay at the end where I talk about um, students, you know, coming up to me after readings and saying, "This happened in my family. We have that same story. Um, you know, we don't talk about that stuff in my family either." Just ways in which they feel like they've been, been um, they they've seen a way for them to tell their own story. So I'm I'm really grateful for that. Um, and there was one uh, young woman at the, I think it was University of, no, it was Oregon State University. And, you know, I was on tour. I, uh, I had lost my voice from a cold 
and from being on tour. And I asked her to read Novena for Bad Indians because I couldn't speak anymore. And she'd already sat in with me on two different classes. So she knew the story and she got up to read and she just, she just started crying. And she said, it's too real. It's too much like my real life. Um, and I apologized and I said, you know, I never should have asked a student to read this poem. I'm sorry, I forgot, you know, after when you're on tour, you kind of read things over and over again and you forget sometimes the intensity. And she, she just kind of sat up and she said, no, you wrote it. I want to read it for the ancestors. They deserve it. And so that, that kind of response reminded me that there are, there's a lot of grief out there. But there's also a lot of tenderness and love for the people who came before us. And writing and speaking their words can be a way to express that love, even as it expresses grief. And that's that was something that, you know, I kind of knew, but to see other people um, absorbing that and um, being able to speak about it, that was really powerful feedback for me. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was really powerful sharing that story. And I will say your book has touched from young when I was 24 and first discovered it all the way to my dad at 76. And I'll never forget mm -hmm. when he came to my first pop up and someone picked up your book while they were shopping. And he's a quiet guy and he's all bad Indians. That book is really good. I really recommend mm -hmm. it. So yeah, it definitely reach so many generations. All of your books have reached so many generations. So my last question, because we only have a few minutes, if anybody wants to be the volunteer to answer this, um, since we always have sh a short amount of time, all three of you are going to be in a forthcoming book by Heyday called No, We Are Here, Voices of Native California Resistance, which I was so excited to hear about and see the cover is stunning. That photo um, that I've seen before, I think is with featuring with Shoyo, it's so beautiful. So if any of you, uh, any one of you could share, you know, uh, just a little preview about that or just, you know, um, just a little bit about your process on that new book. It's wonderful. I'm glad <laughs> it's really wonderful. I'm glad it's coming. I I also want to just be careful about. I love the word. We're all resisting by our our the fact that we've lived. Um, but I think let's try to move. Let's find language that becomes inclusive for all readers rather than resistance, which means, suggests fight or struggle. It is a fight or struggle, but um, there has to, if we're speaking, we have to have somebody hearing. So we want to keep people here. I think it's really important. Um, as I always tell my people, despite what our, our background and so forth, um, that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have to take the high road. We have to be teachers. And this is a great opportunity to teach. And also, I think this is the first California Indian anthology since your anthology, uh, The Sound of Rattles and Clappers. So Wait, you were in. <laughs> I don't think I was in. No, that I was still a baby at that point. Not a baby, but a baby writer. <laughs> and so you, it was kind of my Bible, that. Greg. <laughs> you so, that you've embarrassed me and uh, indicated my age. Deborah. No, no, no. I, I don't think you're that much older than me. I, I didn't even get my degree till I was 40. So what I'm saying is that book, the, the distance between that California Indian anthology and this one, um, wow, what a record of what has passed in our community and what is happening. It's just the beginning. So it's, I mean, that's what excites me the most is is saying, here, watch out, you know, we're, we're still here and we're coming for you <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> and how many of us, yes. And yeah, there's a lot of us, exactly. Absolutely. Perfect way to end it. We are still here. Thank you so much to each one of you. Thank you to AWP for hosting. Thank you to Callie at Hey Day for all of your hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, Hakupa I, uh, so much appreciation and gratitude for all of your thoughtful responses and reading with us. And we can't wait for to read even more. So thank you, Hakupa I. Thank you. I'm honored and touched. Thank you, everybody.